So hi, Dame Jane Anne. How are you doing today? Thank you so much for joining us. Sorry that I can't be there in person for the first time. I'm on holiday with my husband, just the two of us, since our daughter was born. So oh, wow. apologies for not being there with you. And so where are you going? Going to the Caribbean, bit of sunshine. Oh. Um, but I'll be th obviously thinking about women in finance while I'm away. Fantastic. So for those who don't know, you delivered a keynote address at the 2017 Women in Finance Conference. So during your speech, you focused on enhancing female leadership and harnessing talents of women in finance. So how has the financial services industry changed since then? Well, the thing I've been most excited by, to be honest, is that more and more businesses have signed up. So in the last round, we had another 33 businesses sign up. So now organisations that employ more than 800,000 people in financial services are signed up to the charter, and I think that's fantastic. Um, the key thing, I think, is that now people are having to report against their progress um, and that's against the progress that they've made against their own strategic plans, which I think is really important. You know, if you put down your own plan, you ought to be able to hit it. And um, the thing that we're finding is we didn't put quotas in place. And we said to people, you know, tell us as organisations where you think you can get to in terms of the percentage of women in your senior teams. And of course, the majority have said, well, we have to get to 50-50. Many of them have said 50-50 by 2020. And the progress in that respect is very significant. So I'm delighted by that. HM Treasury's 2016 Women in Finance Charter continues to play a leading role in improving gender balance across the UK's financial services services sector. What lessons have we learned along the way and what does the Charter mean to you personally? What lessons have we learned along the way? I think uh, it's very easy to go backwards so we have to keep on focusing on it. Uh, I think Nicky Morgan's speaking either earlier or later today whichever way around it is and you know the fact that the Treasury Select Committee has properly taken hold of this agenda. Nikki herself is writing in the press about the importance of it. I mean, that is very, very important. And I think every single person, however, uh, whatever their role is in an organisation, you know, throughout an organisation, needs to make sure that this stays very central to the commercial agenda, actually, because we know that um, equality and diversity in business isn't just socially right, it's economically right. Yeah. You know, Credit Suisse have done uh, quite regular work, I think, that proves that return on equity in companies that have got balanced um, executive teams can be as much as two percentage points better than those that aren't. So keep the focus on it, treat it as a commercial enterprise, but it's very, very easy to go backwards. And so I think, you know, when the pressure's on, we can see that organisations sort of forget that this is an important part of the agenda and they must not forget. What does it mean to me personally? Um, I think that the thing that I find so powerful about it is the number of people that speak to me about it. Yeah. And so um, it's not something that is um, an afterthought in the financial services industry. It's something that men and women really um, see as important and want to play a part in. And I think that means that it's become a bit of a movement. And we all know that movements make a difference, right? And, uh, and I think that's really, really powerful. And you know, we can make the difference. As I say, men and women make the difference. Well, one of the points I've tried to make ever since we did the charter really is that this isn't just about women. It's about getting equality for men and women. And as a result, growing our economy, making our businesses fair and improving productivity. And uh, that's super important and, and great fun, right? In an interview last year, you mentioned that equality is not simply about improving women's positions and not over men, but about a better economy for society. What will Tomorrow City look like to you and how can we make it better for women? Oh, Tomorrow City. Well, I think we call out a lot of issues now, don't we? Yeah, we whether do. that's the hashtag Me Too moment, whether that's around equality, whether that's about um, doing the right things, particularly, I think, about environmental change. I, I'm um, on a, a not-for-profit board, which you wouldn't think actually was um, involved in the environmental space. And we have a young woman on that board who's absolutely focused on making sure that, you know, the environment is central to everything that we think about. And so I think that um, being really clear on the issues of the day, whether that is the environment, whether that is diversity, what on earth you know, are we doing around leadership and our role in the world, I think that the city will continue to ask itself questions, build on the excellence of all people, um, and as I say, from my point of view, that's the full 
um, range of diversity, not just men and women, if you see what I mean, to make sure that we are, conti and continue to be central to the world, because we, this City of London has always been great, it's always adapted, but it's only adapted through the brilliance and leadership of its people, and so the City of Tomorrow has to take all of the skills of its people and understand that actually now, more than ever, it's super important that everyone is heard and that we lead a new future for our country and for the world. And I do believe it's that big. You know, sometimes it's uh, easy to think within our own organisation or within ourselves, what difference can I make? Yeah. And the answer is we can all make a huge difference and we can make a difference if we do it together. The Charter is about one particular part of doing things together. The city's about a broader thing and I'm excited and optimistic for it. Me too, I'm excited as well. Good. <laughs> in 2018, you won Leadership of the Year in recognition of your personal impacts on culture and success of, at Virgin Money at the Lloyds Bank National Business Awards. What's your advice to other organisations on transforming the culture and effectively changing the way we recruit and work together? I think, so I have a very strong view, which I know not everyone agrees with, that business has an important role to play in society. And, um, you know, famously someone once said that the business of business is business. I don't believe that. I think the business of business is about making things better. Yeah. Somebody said to me the business of business should be human flourishing, if you like, and, and I think that's really important. So in leading a good business, I think um, an organisation has to identify its real purpose. And for me, that's not putting your values up on the walls. <laughs> that's about really understanding, you know, what is the purpose of this organisation? What can we all align for? What are we going to achieve? Where are we going to change the world for good? And then let's make sure that our business really lives up to that expectation. That, I think, is what we mean by culture. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, if you've got a really clear purpose that's to do something for good, then actually some of the difficult things that we see surely fall away. You know, how can you have a, a good purpose and bad behaviours? And you should have to call out those bad behaviours too. Um, and so I think a purposeful business culture for the city and, and, of course, outside London and the city too, is something that's going to make sure that all organisations thrive for the future. And for me, that's the, the essence of, of leadership. I read a brilliant article in the Times a couple of weeks ago, which Matthew Said had written about uh, Man United, actually. And he was talking about what Alex Ferguson had done for culture compared to managers subsequently. And he pointed out that um, under Ferguson, uh, the Man United players would have bled to death for each other. And he questioned whether now the players would cross the road for each mm. other. And I just thought that it was a really interesting insight into the difference of leadership. How do you... It's, it's, great leadership isn't about the leader, it's about what the leader enables the organisation to do, how it feels and how it behaves. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really interested in that. So do you think that unconscious biases are tackled correctly during the hiring process? Unconscious bias, I think, is um, shockingly alive in us all. So after we had uh, put together the Women in Finance Charter all those years ago, it seems like a long time ago now, um, it was very clear that women in particular felt that unconscious bias was something that was holding them back in their organisations. Um, and so one of our recommendations was unconscious bias training for everyone, including myself and my team at Virgin oh, Money. Okay. And I think when you go through the training and you realise that actually, however broad-minded you think you are, you do inevitably, I think, given where you're brought up, how you're brought up, you know, who you are, um, people have those sort of biases. I think it's really important that we all understand what they are so that we're alive to them in every walk of life, but particularly in the recruitment process. Now, you know, one of the things we did at Virgin Money, which worked very well, was led by our people director, was to make sure that all um, sort of um, recruitment lists that came in from headhunters or employment agencies were balanced in themselves, so that that made it very much easier for people to choose um, skills rather than people, if you see what I mean. But nevertheless, we, we also um, made sure that uh, we were recruiting in a balanced way. I remember just sort of uh, developing that, that story a little bit, that um, I was also, one of the things that women say on um, why they don't like to stay in financial services is all to do with the bonus culture. And what they say is that men tend to ban the table and say, you know, I've had a great year, pay me a good bonus. And women tend to say, I'm not going to ban the table. I've had a great year, pay me a good bonus. And want that to be recognised rather than shouted about. Um, but of course, 
weaker middle managers in particular are much more likely to respond to the people that bang the table and that's why women say well you know, on that basis I'm not being rewarded for the job that I do so you know for goodness sake um, you know let's get let's get over that and I think training senior managers is equally important to make sure that people are um, seen in a well-balanced way for what they deliver for the organisation, <laughs> not for who they are or where they might come from. And I think that's really important. Um, so going back to what you previously mentioned earlier on in the interview, do you think that racial and age diversity is greatly considered when hiring women in the workplace? And how can this positively impact a business? Well, and, and of course, um, sexual preference, if you like, that's yes, the right way of yes, putting it. Yes. I mean, I, I think it's super important. You know, my husband's Indian, and so therefore that's something that's been important to me all my life. Um, I, I think that, and, and by the way, now I'm old, I think that age diversity <laughs> is important as well. So um, I think we have to be clear that we value people for who they are and, that, and the team that they build, if you see what I mean. And... Um, it's become more and more obvious, hasn't it, in recent years, that if you sit in a room with a bunch of people that are just like you, you can never really create something that's better than you. <laughs> and you need a whole variety of social background is as important as racial uh, background, I think, or you know, any other sort of difference. And um, I've often said that one of the um, meetings that I enjoy the most in, in my life is uh, one that's run by Sadiq Khan, where he has a business advisory group that is the most diverse group of people that I work with. And you really can feel the difference um, from sitting around a table of, um, you know, to be derogatory, you know, older white men, <laughs> um, or broader, younger, racially diverse people with very different backgrounds. And I think what it does is it brings a level of um, challenge and excitement and innovation to the room that mean that people build on individual creativity and get to a better answer. And that's why it's so important. Now, do I think that in the hiring process we've got there yet? Absolutely not. But I think the fact that um, so many people are now recognising the importance of that sort of diversity will get us to the right place or get some organisations to the right place quicker than others. And I think the success of those organisations, then others will want to emulate. And so it should become um, a virtuous circle. But we do have to keep holding people's feet to the fire to do it because it's so easy to revert to type. Um, and so I think, you know, keeping the agenda at the forefront of board executive committees, CEOs and other leaders is, is critical. As we know, you promote well-being and resilience, and you've also been very open about your own mental health struggles. So lastly, my question to you would be, what would your advice be to your younger self in the earlier stages of your career? Um, I think that um, what I've realised as I've got older is that the things I worried about were never really that important. You know, I can see it in my own daughter and who, you know, she's still in her mid-teens, right? So I was embarrassed about everything. And I realised that I used to be a bit like that, you know, there's so much pressure to conform. And yet, actually, it's those that don't conform that make most difference. And I'm not suggesting that everybody just goes off and wildly does their own thing. <laughs> but what I do think is that, there is that there's so much pressure on us all to be fit in. And I think I tried to do that. I tried to fit in and never quite did. And I was always criticised, often by men, always by a man comes in <laughs> um, as being too emotional. Now, what did that mean? It certainly didn't mean I burst into tears everywhere, but I think it meant that I felt things um, and articulated them in a personal way, um, which when I was growing up in business was not what you did. And I think that, um, you know, now that's much more acceptable. I would say to people, you know, be proud of who you are, bring your true self to work. Um, don't try and conform to somebody else's view of who you should be. Decide what difference you might want to make in the world. Take your opportunities and get out there and be proud of what you can achieve because we can all achieve so much if we're not constrained by everybody else's idea of what we should or shouldn't be. So what does all of that say? In a nutshell, I'd say it's just so important that we're all clear on who we are, proud of it, and get out there and be ourselves. Because I think then that... You know, a lot of mental health issues come because we try and be who we're not. Mm. And uh, I think that, um, you know, if we can be self-aware and proud of it, then an awful lot comes from that.
So thank you very much, Dame Jane Ann, for joining us today. I'm sure everyone enjoyed this interview as much as I did, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you very much, Ray. Great to meet you. Great to meet you too.